Wow. Thank you so much. You know, at this stage of my life, when I hear introductions like that, I'm wondering if I'm attending my own funeral. <laughs> it's kind of like, whoa, you know something I don't know. But it's a, it's a joy to be here with you. Uh, blessings on you. Uh, happy Father's Day uh, to the brothers here. And uh, it's, it's just a delight. Uh, we own the remote until midnight. So uh, <laughs> happy Father's Day. And for, for those at the other locations, what a joy it is to be able to minister to you at least through this means here. Also want to bring greetings from my wife. She is the absolute joy of my life, and uh, we celebrated our 53rd wedding anniversary last month. And Yeah. Girlfriend deserves combat pay for being married to me that long. And uh, we actually met in, in college uh, the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, about two weeks before I came back on campus for my sophomore year. My high school sweetheart, Kick me to the curb. Can you imagine somebody getting rid of all of this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, I can see that. But uh, <laughs> this is a true story. I came back on campus. Uh, first day back, I was in my dorm room praying. I said, God, no more women. I'm hurting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I just have been bruised and hurt. And this semester, I'm not going to date anybody or this kind of thing. Just you and me, Jesus. I'm going to stay focused on, on, on you and, and no, not, not going to be distracted distracted or, de just, you know, deterred or whatever, it just single-minded commitment. And people who know me know that when my mind's made up, I can be fairly focused. So I left, the, left my dorm room. I was going to this other building on campus, mind filled with this deep-seated, stalwart, single-minded commitment. Stay focused on Jesus and your studies this semester. I get to this building, I open the door, and there's a young lady I hadn't seen before. And I don't know what happened. I get healed instantly. <laughs> All of a sudden, my burdens were gone. And my mama taught me to be hospitable to strangers, and she was new on campus. And I said, hello, my name is Crawford Loritz. What's yours? And Karen Williams. I said, well, you know, I've been assigned to be your tour guide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been showing her around now for 53 hours, and she's been showing me around for all this, all this time. It is a treat to be here. Um, I, I love your, your pastor. He's a new friend, and uh, uh, just am grateful for him inviting me to come. And I've also I've heard so much about your church through the years here, and, and it's a treat to be here and to, and to experience the warmth and the fellowship of our time together. We've got a long ways to go in a short time to get there, so if you have a Bible, a device, or an extremely good memory... <laughs> Turn with me to Psalm 90 and just leave it open there for a while. I uh, want to loosely talk about toward a work life, and I'm going to put quotes around balance. Toward a work life, and I'll put quotes around balance. But before we dive in, let's have a word of prayer together. Holy Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your power. We thank you, God, for the privilege of knowing you. We thank you for the gift of this day. In fact, this is all we have right now. We don't control anything. Thank you that you're with us. And I do pray in the name of your son that you'll arrest our attention. I, I pray that you'll give us the ability to focus, that we will not be distracted or deterred in any way from what you have to say to us. May we not lose any spiritual equity that you want to accrue today. Bless your word, we pray, and not my feeble attempts at articulation. God, we need you, and we need a word from heaven. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Some years ago, and in fact, it was about 25-plus years ago, I came perilously close to burnout. I didn't exactly burn out, but I tell you, uh, uh, I was just a few days away. Uh, and by the way, it was all good stuff that I was involved in, wonderful stuff. Um, my life was packed and full, raising a family. I was in leadership with an organization, with crew at the time. Um, my first book had come out, and there was a lot of stuff associated with that. And I was speaking in a bunch of places, giving leadership and all that, just shoving everything in, just sticking my hand in a pot of spaghetti and throwing it to the wall. Whatever stuck, I went with it. And I was getting a bit overwhelmed. 
I found myself, um, and I don't have a personality that deals, you know, everybody has a little bit of anger in them, but I don't have a personality that gets ticked off too easily, but I found myself being constantly irritated, not being able to sleep well at night, um, just being overwhelmed. And a dear friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years, we were both speaking at the same event, he, he had asked me, we hadn't seen each other in a while, he said, Crawford, how you doing? And I just dumped it all out. I said, man, I, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. All these wonderful things are happening, and I'm busy and all of this stuff. And he, he just said this to me. He said, Crawford, there comes a time in your life well, you have to stop doing the things that you can do and do the things that you should do. And then he walked away. It was as if the Holy Spirit grabbed me and said to me, Crawford, you're going to kill yourself doing good stuff. The stuff that will destroy you, the stuff that will mess you up is not the categorically opposite stuff. It's not the D minus stuff or the C minus stuff or the F stuff. The stuff that will cannibalize your life is the B minus and C plus stuff, the fairly good stuff. And the question that we all have to ask ourselves, what were we born for? What were we born to do? And after that conversation, I tell you what, some other of my friends got in my grill and thank God for people that can hold you accountable, or at least you submit to the accountability. I went on a, a sabbatical, and I emerged from that time. God spoke to my heart. And one of the things at the top of the list that I, I got lovingly beat up about was that there's only three things in my life that I do that nobody else can do for me. Only three. Nobody can walk with God for me but me. I own that. There's no such thing as substitute surrogate sanctification. <laughs> Nobody can be the husband of Karen LaRitz for me but me. I own that. And nobody can be the dad of Brian, Heather, Brendan, and Holly for me but me. I own that. Every single thing else I do, everything else I do, every single thing else I do, somebody can, and by the way, they will do. When you die, and by the way, ain't none of us getting out of here alive unless Jesus comes back. When you die... They may kick some dirt on your coffin or go, you know, see your picture if you get, you know, cremated or whatever it is. But I got to tell you, before the dirt is hard, they're going to be passing out a position focus sheet to replace you. <laughs> Don't get demented. All of the stuff that we pour our hearts into, we pursue fool's gold. When we look over our lives, I'm, I'm at a stage of my life, you look over your life, you go, how much of this stuff was, did, did God really have his hand on? We pursue good ideas rather than be driven by the purposes and plans of God. So the question is, how do we manage the lives that God has given to us? What, what, what do we do? And by the way, let me get back to the word balance. Uh, I put quotes around balance because I, have not, I don't use that term intentionally. I stopped using it about 20, 25 years ago. Because, you know, to say that you're living a balanced life makes, the, makes an assumption that the targets are always stationary. That somehow balance is just a stationary thing. I think the more accurate description of all of our lives, the more healthy thing to say is that I'm always pressing into the dynamic tensions. What are you talking about? Well, your, your marriage is not the same as it was five years ago. Things change, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. Your kids, their needs change. You can't relate to them the same way you did when they were five or six years old, when they're 10 and 15 and 20 years old. Issues on your job change. You change. And so what we have to embrace in life if we want to move toward being effective is communication, adjustment, and movement toward where things are at this point. There are times in your life where you're free to travel more. Or maybe if you, you know, you've you got a ministry or a job that takes you on a road, then there are issues in your family where you never rest your things back. There are times when you can volunteer more at church, and then there are times, well, no, that's out of balance. 
The question is, how do we steward our lives? How do we live lives that we leverage and maximize our, our, moment, our moment in history? You see, God has given to us the gift of time to demonstrate and declare through our lives what's most important. Did you hear what I just said? God has given us the gift of time to declare through our moments in history what is most important. That's why we have time. Time is just a resource. Money, money is neutral. Well, the love of money is wrong, but money is neutral. Money is just a resource. So it is with time. It's just a resource. The purpose of money and the purpose of time is to leverage the money and time to maximize what's most important in your life. That's why we're here. Time is a gift. Money is a gift. Are you maximizing it? Am I maximizing it? Am I maximizing it? Now, I promise you we're going to get back to Psalm 90, but I want to I just quote a couple of verses over here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, because the apostle Paul summarizes exactly what I just said. He says in verse 15, he said, look, look carefully then how you walk. The word walk there, it's a Greek word, peripateo, it's a colloquialism that Paul uses to summarize how you live the daily concourse of your life every day. Crawford, Crawford, pay attention to how you're living. Reject passivity. Pay attention. Pay attention to how you, you're walking, not as unwise, but as wise. How do you do that? Well, by making the best use of your time. Time. This all sets up the psalm that Moses wrote in Psalm 90. He said, Moses wrote a psalm? Yeah, he wrote a psalm. You know, David wrote the, pretty much a lion's share. Uh, Asaph wrote some. The sons of Korah wrote some. But this psalm, Psalm 90, was written by Moses. Throughout the psalm, Moses is driving home the brevity of life, the brevity of life, the brevity of life, the brevity of life. And for those of us who are high control people, we have problems with this because it's the realization that mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. you control nothing. Control nothing. All of us are one text message away from sipping Maalox. We control and one doctor's visit away from. You know, we we control nothing. And at any given moment, God can say, give me back my breath. Life is fragile. And because of this brevity, what do we do? He sets it up here in Psalm 90, verse. Um, Verse 10, he says, and I, I, he says, the, the, the years of, your, of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we, we fly away. We're history. I mean, he's, he, he's a little cold-blooded. He didn't miss mince words. He said, look, maybe 70. If you pass 70, this is bonus coverage, brother. You know, this is overtime. And you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be gone. You're gonna be gone. And the truth of the matter, when you die and your friends die, you got a generation and a half that might remember that you existed. It's true. It's true. We're not nearly as invincible as we might think. So based upon this, what do you do? Well, Moses, just like Paul says, and this, this psalm, really, you can consider it an exposition on that statement in Ephesians 5. Moses says, well, in light of that, it should drive urgency. 
You see, life is but a brief moment in history lodged between two vast eternities. Every day of your life and my life, we've got to say, what am I doing with my moment? I don't have this moment again. You don't have it again. What are you doing with this bing, little moment lodged between two vast eternities? What am I going to do with that? And it's almost as if when you read the succeeding, the, the next few verses, it's almost as if Moses reaches out and grabs his readers by the lapels. Hey, man, you're going to fly away. Okay? So what should I do now? And he forces us and drives us to make three critical decisions. Three critical, they're not profound, but they're very, they're compellingly clear. He says, based upon the brevity of life, you don't control the clock nor the calendar. Based upon the brevity of life, you, you got to do these three things. You have to. You've got to decide to live wisely. You've you, you got to decide, believe it or not, I'll unpack this in a second, to live contentedly. And you've got to decide, decide to live strategically. Don't, in the words of John Piper in that famous little book he wrote a number of years ago, don't, don't, don't waste your life. The first thing he says is that time is short. You don't know when it's over. All of us have an expiration date stamped on us, and we don't know what it is. Based upon that, upon that the very first thing is, that we have to do is to, is to live wisely. Verse 12 says, so, so, so. As a result, that you're only going to live maybe 70 years. Some of, you, some of us not that long, and we, some of us might have a couple of bonus lefts, but so... Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. When he says, teach us to number our days, it doesn't mean that we sit down and we, we can't have anticipate, okay, I got this, this, this many seconds, this many hours. It's not what he's talking about. I think the, the, the greater import of what he's saying is that teach us to consider that in this life, we have a limited amount of time. We have a limited amount of time. So teach us to number our days. Why? So that as you look in the rearview mirror of your life, you see the legacy of wisdom and not of stupidity and foolishness. Wisdom is the practical, transferable uh, application of knowledge. By the way, you can Google knowledge, but you can't Google wisdom. You can get content, but you got to be skillful. Skillful is the operative term when it comes to wisdom. It is a skillful, appropriate application of knowledge to all of the issues in your life, and that comes by experience. And I think he's implying, stop taking laps around Mount Sinai. I used to tell our kids this all the time. My boys especially, they hated this, especially in those teen years. They went through seasons of temporary insanity. I would tell them this, all right, man, look, experience ain't always the best teacher, but it is the only school a fool will attend. Why you keep, you, you actually think that wall is going to move? You run into it about five times now, and you got, you know, your head is swollen, so you think it's going to move? And this is what he's saying. So, well, no, 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 no. Number your days, man. Don't keep making these jacked up decisions. There are other implications here. Number one is that you cannot, <laughs> you cannot manage time. Stop telling people to manage time. That, that's, that's, that's a stupid thing. You can't manage time. There's no such thing as time management. You can only manage yourself in light of the time that you have. It's about self-management. 
The clock is ruthless. You ain't going to stop it. The calendar is ruthless. You're not going to stop it. You can't control it. You can't manage it. The best thing you can do in light of what Moses is saying is take the time that you have. It's limited. And in light of that time, manage yourself. You see, I've learned something I wish I had known 50 years ago. I have learned that discipline is a pathway to freedom. It sounds crazy. But if you want to experience freedom, you've got to embrace discipline. Undisciplined lives leads to frustration. And the constant pursuit of fulfillment... The second implication from this verse is that everything about us is affected by the choices and decisions that we make. I don't mean to sound cold-blooded here, but listen to me. I got a little mileage on me now. Hear me, hear me, hear me. One of the harsh, cold realities of life is that we are what we decide to be. You see, when you're born, you look like your parents. But when you die, you look like your decisions. Even even if people have abused you and done horrible things to you, horrible things, that's not justified. But the truth of the matter is, I still control my responses and my reactions. I still control that. And so what Moses is implying is that we should teach us to number our days. Hey, 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 hey. Don't be passive. Don't give the control of your choices and decisions to to nebulous uh, environmental concerns or somebody else and living all your life blaming people on what you did and what you didn't have and all this other kind of stuff, angry and cynical and all of that stuff. No, buddy, Crawford. This is horrible what happened to you. It sucks, man, but what are you going to do? Somebody here needs to hear that. Quit procrastinating your joy and happiness until your circumstances change. Weep, cry, get help, get counseling, get perspective, but at the end of the day, life is lived in a verb position. What are we deciding? And the third implication of teach us to number our days, deciding to live wisely, number three, is to identify core values and priority relationships, which in turn will establish how you use and direct your time. We get frustrated We keep saying, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough time. That's not the question. The question is the level of your intentionality about your life. What are your values? What will you die for? What will you live for? What gives weight to you? What gives weight to me? What makes me pound the table and weep? What do you mean? Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.10 that God has prepared good works for us to walk in. What are those good works? Are you just rolling the dice with your life? It's a crapshoot. Most of us probably could use some time alone with the Lord on our knees and asking him rather than, rather than giving him a list of things he ought to do in my life as if he needs to be kept busy. <laughs> Maybe what we need to do is close our mouths, open our ears, 
and ask him, God, what was I born for? What was I born for? What signature have you written over my soul that I need to steward until I walk into your presence? I want my life to count. What are the core relationships? You can't neglect them. Everybody will jump into the same train car that you and your family are in. But after a while, those suckers are going to leave. What's the condition of those relationships? Spend so much time trying to impress people and climb a ladder, and the folks don't even care that much about you. Teach us to number our days. I need to hurry up here. The first one is this. Moses said, hey, 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 <laughs> life is a gift. We got an expiration date. You ain't going to live down here forever. You're going to live someplace on the other side forever, but not down here. We're just pilgrims and strangers passing through. A lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is a gift from God to fuel urgency about what matters most. So you got to decide to live wisely. Secondly, you got to decide to live contentedly. You say, well, what? No. wait, 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 you just talking about urgency. Now you're talking about contentment. Well, listen to what he says here, verse, verse 14. Moses prays, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love <laughs> that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. What's the source of joy and rejoicing and being glad all your days? It's not the circumstances of our lives. It's our relationship with God. He uses a word that's translated loving kindness. It's the Hebrew word chesed. It, it's, 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 it's hard to even describe that word. It takes your breath away. It's, it's God's proactive demeanor toward us, which is incredible, unconditional love and kindness. In other words, I think what he's saying is this, that the core of, of how you should live and work and greet all the stuff in life is centered on your contentment in an ever-present God who cares about you and loves you. You don't have to live life frenetically. You don't have to live life as if the circumstances and the stuff around you control your demeanor and your ups and your downs. Joy in the Bible is, is so different. Joy in the Bible is a choice and a decision that's lodged in the consistency and the never-changing nature of God. Joy in the Bible is stuff that cannot be affected or contaminated or moved by the incredible stuff that takes place that's unpredictable in this life. That's the reason why in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13... We misquote that verse. If I hear another young preacher, <laughs> we hijack the verse. We quote, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I'll never forget our youngest son was my early retirement program. He was quite the baseball player. My dad played in the old Negro Leagues. I played a little baseball. And Brendan was probably 10 times better than both of us combined. And I'll never forget where his high school <laughs> Uh, uh, he, he, he pitched and played third base, and um, he was pretty dominant as a pitcher. However, he was on the mound, and, and uh, he, was getting, he was behind in a count, and he was getting frustrated. And by the way, his mother, you know, in the high school feels the, the, the fans are right on top of you. His mother said that, uh, called out and said, Brendan, throw strikes. And I'll never forget this. I just laughed like crazy. Brendan steps off the mound and goes, Mom, what do you think I'm trying to do? So... <laughs> Hilarious. She didn't think it was so funny, though. Uh, and then he took his hat off, and he, and he read something in the middle of his hat. And Karen said to me, hey, Crawford, what is he doing? I said, well, he's reading Philippians 4.13, but that ain't going to help him throw strikes. <laughs> he needs to find strikes. So we quote the verse as if we can do whatever we want to do. You need to drop the verse in its broader context. 
The broader context there, the verses before that, Paul is talking about contentment. He said, you know what? There have been times in which I've been banked. I've got a lot of resources, a lot of shekels in my, in my bag. And then there are times when I didn't have any of that stuff. But you know what I found? That in every given set of circumstances, my demeanor does not need to be determined by the stuff that is happening to me, but by the one who's inside of me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, gives me the ability to face the, the, the incredible, unpredictable nature of life. You see, hear me on this. Hear me on this. Stop looking to li for life to bring you a sense of fulfillment and joy. Christians bring a sense of fulfillment and joy to life. Our relationship with a sovereign God brings stability to the stuff that's all around us. He's our satisfaction. That's the reason why, you know, believers, we walk in the situation that why aren't they losing their minds? Why are they looking to the Lord? We live under his lordship. Hear me on this. Contentment, this sounds crazy, contentment is a matter of submission. If we're not willing to submit to the Lordship of Christ, we're always going to be bifurcated and conflicted. Always. Always. So, when Moses prays, Oh, oh, God, satisfy us in the morning before my feet touch the floor with your chesed, your loving kindness. Uh, we're rounding third. We've got to come home. Here. The third decision is this. It's the brevity of life. Nobody's stopping the calendar. Nobody's stopping the clock. And you don't know when it's all going to be over. So what do you do? Crawford, get your backside in gear. That's what you do. You, you need to live wisely. Don't keep making these silly jacked up decisions, man. Secondly, you, 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 you need to live contentedly. Your life is the expression of God's goodness. And then thirdly, you need to live strategically. Now, I suppose if you push me in the corners, uh, strategy should be a manifestation of wisdom. But listen to what he says here in verses 16 and 17. Moses says, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to the children, to their children. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What is he saying here? He's saying, look, 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 look. Although he doesn't use the word eternity or eternal perspective, that's what he's talking about. I think he's, he's saying two things. Listen, if, if you want to leave footprints in the sands of time, you definitely have to wear work boots. You have to wear, life is, you want your steps to be permanent. We were born to matter. But the statement we make is not about us, it's a statement about him. We are pilgrims and strangers rushing through this land. There's a nomadic characteristic, of, a character of Christianity or the peoples of God. We're marching through this place. Marching through. And the reason why, and I don't mean to sound cute here, but the reason why God doesn't kill us when we give our hearts to Jesus and take us right to heaven 
is because, is because of the theology of the peoples of God, meaning we, we, we represent an incarnational presence during our moment in history. Your life and my life is a demonstration of the plan and the purposes of God during the time that we are here. A watching world needs to see lives that are motivated by the principles of another world. Another world. And that's the only lasting statement we make. You hear me? You hear me? It's the only lasting statement. Listen, one of the sad things, and I mean this, I said to my wife here a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, sweetheart, chances are our grandkids will be the last generation. I stick around. Well, I got a grandson that's 23. He might get married to my great-grandkids. That, that's a bonus. But, uh, you know, our grandkids... Our grandkids are the last generation that might be alive to remember our voices. What are you passing on to the next generation? What, what is there about your life and my life that's enduring? Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, we do all the wonderful stuff. We take our, yeah, take our grandkids to Disney World and all of that and you know, it's, it's great and wonderful, and that's good. And my wife, she says that uh, we're going to take everybody. We've got 11 grandkids, four adult children, their spouses, and us. And she informed me that we're going to take everybody on a cruise. I said, okay, honey, at this stage of the game, whatever you want is yes. Now, we might have to get us a room at the rescue mission, but the answer is yes. All right? <laughs> Then I'll say, did you enjoy that? Uh, so, you know, we, we, we do all these things, don't get me wrong, and we should enjoy life. We should. But two, three generations down the road, they ain't going to remember Mickey. They're not going to remember being up on the Lido deck. What's enduring about you? How are you ordering your life strategically to make the eternal the centerpiece of your life? Let me tell you this quick story, and I'll, I'll be done. My great-grandfather, his name was Peter, Peter Loritz. Peter was a slave. Woke up this morning thinking about him, Father's Day. My dad would have been 110 years old this year. He was born February the 13th, 1914. So it was my, not my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, Peter, was a slave. My dad remembered Peter. Peter grew, uh, became, he, he was very old when he passed away. My dad remembers him. Peter, although he couldn't read or couldn't write, loved the Word of God. <laughs> he said, how? Well, you know, he used to make his children, as the family lore goes, he used to make his children and grandchildren read him Read them favorite passages of scripture over and over and over and over and over again. The old boy had memorized some of it. Love Jesus. Love Jesus. And his commitment to Christ forged generations in our family, forged generations of strong men. My grandfather Milton. My, 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 my grandfather Milton had, uh, you know, 14 children. My dad was the youngest boy of the 14, seven boys, seven girls. How about that? Fast forward. The old homestead is in a place called Conover, North Carolina. Um, and uh, uh, there's a cemetery there uh, across the street from the old homestead. There's a cemetery behind this little church called Thomas Chapel, Amy Zion Church. And about a third to half of the people buried there are related to me, <laughs> the Loritzes. Fast forward. A couple of years ago, my oldest son and I were speaking at the uh, Cove, the Billy Graham Center there in Asheville, North Carolina, and, uh, and Conover, North Carolina, is only, a, only less than about 50 minutes down, 50, 55 minutes down Interstate 40 from there. And I said to Brian, Brian had not been there since he was a little guy, I hadn't been back to the old homestead since, uh, for, for many years. I said to Brian, you, you want to go down to Conover? He said, yeah, let's do it. So we hopped in the car, went down there, found my way to Thomas Chapel. Uh, I was sort of, sort of impressed with myself that I remembered that. And uh, then got to the cemetery, and we walked to the cemetery, and I began telling 
Brian who these people were. I said, here's Pop Pop's parents, my grandparents, your great grandparents, Milton and Anna. And there's Pop Pop's brother, Uncle Gaynell, and, and there's other brother, Wardell, over here. And then there's Uncle Emery here, and there's Aunt Annie over there. And as I began telling them about these people, I was ambushed by emotion. I began to weep. Because it dawned on me, I said, Brian, son, nobody knows who these people are. I don't even think they ever in their lifetime went beyond Charlotte, North Carolina. But these people love God. And son, these folks paid your tuition. Because they live for what matters most. The folks who read your books, who listen to you, who are following you, son, it ain't about you. It's not about me. They lived for what mattered most. So what Moses is saying is make sure during your moment in history you're benchmarking the next generation with what matters most. The core to that is knowing Christ as your Savior and Lord. Turning your life over to him, the author of life. And if you yet to trust him as your Savior, don't waste your life. Don't waste the time. You don't control the clock or the calendar. The day you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Respond to him. You were born for a relationship with him. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin and I trust you as my Savior and Lord. And he will come into your heart and life. Father, thank you for yourself. Thank you, God, for the kindness of the people here and those who are watching Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll help us to embrace the gift of life. Lord, may we live wisely. May we live contentedly. And by all means, may we live strategically. Thank you for your love and your patience. And thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen.